Hey everyone, welcome back to the program. Now today we're talking about Paul McCartney's first bass. Now for a long time, we thought this was stolen sometime in 1969, but only recently, as in like the last couple of days, we found out that this is not the case whatsoever. In fact, the bass was stolen a few years after that, and the story behind it's kind of crazy. And in this video, we're gonna talk about the history of the bass, how Paul got it, what happened to it and how it was found after all of these years. But before I get into all that, I just wanna take a moment and ask you to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. It makes a big difference and I really appreciate it. Thank you to those who already have. All right, on with the video. So in order to tell this story, we need to go back to the winter of 1960 and talk about why Paul started playing bass in the first place. Originally, he played guitar. In fact, at one point, there were three guitarists in the Beatles with John and George. Pete Best was on drums, and Stu Sutcliffe was their bass player. After their first trip to Hamburg, Stu decided not to return to Liverpool right away, preferring to be with his girlfriend, Astrid. This left the Beatles without a bass player for about a month and a half. At the suggestion of Pete, the Beatles hired Chaz Newby to fill in for a few gigs in December of 1960, but he left the group in January of 1961 to return to university. This once again left the Beatles without a basis. As a temporary measure, Paul filled in by stringing his cheap Rossetti guitar with piano strings until Stu returned to England on the 20th of January. By March, the Five Piece were back in Hamburg playing the Top 10 Club, but Stu was growing tired of life as a musician. His other passion was art, and he recently received a scholarship to attend a summer session at a fine arts university in Hamburg. Seeing how more and more of his life was in Germany and not with the Beatles, he decided to leave the group once they finished their engagement at the Top 10 Club in July. And at this point, the Beatles decided to continue on as a four-piece, and it was pretty much decided for Paul that he would pick up the bass, as John didn't know how to play it, and George was too good as a guitarist. But for about a month, Stu continued to play in the band, but he wasn't able to attend every gig since he was still going to school full-time. During those times he was absent, Paul switched from playing piano to playing bass, but this meant borrowing Stu's bass since Paul's Rossetti guitar met an unfortunate end one day when it was dropped and damaged beyond repair. Paul didn't like playing Stu's bass because it was heavier than he liked, and he had to play it upside down since he was left-handed, and Stu requested that Paul not change the strings around. As you can imagine, Paul eventually grew tired of playing it this way and decided to buy his own bass. He went to Steinway & Sons in Hamburg and tried out the Hofner 501 bass. He liked how light it felt, especially compared to Stu's bass. It was smaller than that, and the symmetry of the design really appealed to him. The price was also a good value, not too cheap, but still affordable quality. He ended up special ordering a left-handed model for around 30 pounds, and this is the bass that would go on to be a part of Beatles history. It established his iconic look with the band. In fact, I would argue that it's the most recognizable Beatles instrument. Now, Paul used this 1961 bass for over 250 shows at the Cavern Club and recorded with it on their first two albums. But by late 1963, the Hofner Company gave him a new bass, an updated version of his original with some slight modifications. This new bass became his instrument of choice, both for touring and for recording, although his original 1961 bass would stay with him as a backup. In 1964, Paul sent it in to Burns Guitars for refurbishment, and a new custom shroud was added around the pickups. It was also given a new paint job and a thick coat of polyurethane. The last time it was seen by the public was during the sessions for Let It Be in 1969. And up to this point, the prevailing theory is that someone either took it from Twickenham Studios or the Apple headquarters. But that's as far as it got. No one knew what happened to it after that. Now we fast forward to 2019. The Hofner Company was making a new backup bass for Paul, and their marketing manager, Nick Wass, was talking with him about what he wanted from the new instrument. As an off remark, Paul asked him if he knew what happened to his original one, and Nick didn't know the answer. But his curiosity took over, and he started a search for the stolen bass. Now, Nick couldn't have been a more perfect person to lead this search, since he is an expert when it comes to Hofner basses. Not only does he work for the company, he even co-wrote the definitive book on the instrument. 
By December of 2019, there was a dedicated web page on the official Hofner website. The page detailed the many unique features of Paul's 1961 base, but gave little answers. For several years, the page sat without updates. But then in May of 2023, Naomi and Scott Jones reached out to Nick and joined the search. Now, the Joneses are a married couple with years of professional experience in investigations and journalism, including working with the BBC. By August of 2023, the Lost Base webpage was reborn as a dedicated site called thelostbase.com. But it was Scott's September 2nd article for The Telegraph that really accelerated the investigation. This was followed by various interviews for TV and radio, which really helped to spread the word. Eventually, they ended up receiving over 100 suggestions and over 600 people reaching out offering to help. But not every tip was helpful. In fact, early on in the investigation, a man who claimed to be a roadie for The Who said he stole Paul's base from Apple headquarters in January of 1969. Now, two witnesses backed his story, and Nick was able to confirm that he did, in fact, work for The Who, and the band was playing a show in London around the same time that the base was last seen. Now, everything seemed to line up that this guy took the base, but all that changed when they got their first real break in the search. Ian Horn, a former sound engineer for Paul during the 70s, emailed the investigating team letting them know that the base was actually stolen in 1972. Now, Ian and another sound engineer for Paul, Trevor Jones, were in charge of a large moving truck that was used to move instruments and gear around London from one studio to another. On the evening of October 10th, they were working very late, and instead of unloading the truck for the night, they decided to park it on the street near Trevor's home, which was near the Notting Hill district of West London. The next morning, they found the padlock broken and the truck empty. They reported the theft to the police, and even the big three London newspapers all wrote about the crime, but I don't think they understood that this was Paul McCartney's gear, and I think that's because Paul decided against filing a police report because he didn't want to make it a big story since he knew the press would smear Ian and Trevor's reputations. They were loyal to him, and so he ultimately let the theft go. He figured it was just a base. He could get another one. It wasn't worth hurting the livelihood of these two men. When Nick learned of Ian's story, it reminded him of an earlier lead that he initially brushed off in February of 2023. When he reached out to the anonymous tipster again to get more details, he learned that it was his father who broke into the truck and then sold the base to Ronald Guest, the landlord of the Admiral Blake pub in London. Ronald then gave the base to his eldest son, but he was tragically killed in an auto accident while at university. The base then went to his younger brother, who kept it for the rest of his life. He passed away during the height of COVID in 2020, but his wife is still alive and knew of an old base that was stored in their attic. She just happened to see Nick on TV talking about Paul's stolen base, and then she put two and two together and brought it to McCartney's people in London. Now, I'm sure Paul was thrilled to have his base back along with his original case, but he needed to be sure that it was the real one and not a replica. So by the end of September 2023, Nick drove from Germany to England to verify the base in person, and it didn't take long for him to determine that it was the real deal. And one of the key details was found on the back of the instrument. Every replica base, and even ones made in 1961, all feature a flat back, but this one had a rounded back, a detail that no one other than Paul could have known because the back was never photographed. Now, Nick thinks that this could be a prototype Hofner since it was a special order left-handed base, possibly the first ever one made by Hofner. Also, 1961 was a transitional year for the company as they moved away from solid wood tops to plywood, so it's very likely they were experimenting with different manufacturing ideas, such as a rounded back, but decided against it and shelving the prototype. And so when that special order came in, they used that body for Paul's base just to make some room. Now, the only part of this story that is a little confusing is the timeline. Now, I read an interview with Nick, and he says the base was found at the end of September. The New York Times also states this, but the AP claims the base was given to Paul in December, and then it took two months to authenticate. Now, I'm inclined to believe Nick because what does he gain by lying? But still, it's confusing when exactly Paul took possession of the base. The only thing I can think of is that they didn't want the news of the base being found to take away any attention from the buildup to the new Beatles single, Now and Then. 
The timelines don't exactly match up as the first announcement of the single came around the end of October, but still it makes me wonder why there was such a delay. Also, fun fact, you can see one of the 1961 replica bases in the video for the single. Whatever the case may be, in the end, all that really matters is that after 50 years, Paul's first base is back where it belongs. So what's next for it? According to Nick, Paul has no plans to restore it back to its 1961 condition, but instead wants it to be playable again. While it's in fairly good shape for its age and being stored in an attic for so many years, experiencing extreme temperature changes, it's in need of some repairs. The neck is broken, the pickups aren't working, and the control knobs will need to be fixed as well. And with the recent announcement of a new album from Paul in 2024, it does make me wonder if he will record or re-record any of the bass parts using his original bass. Time will tell, but I'm excited in either case. All right, everyone, that will do it for today. Be sure to let me know what you think of this story. Are you hopeful that Paul will use this bass on his upcoming album? Do you think he's gonna tour with it? I'm inclined to think he won't just because supposedly this base could go for as much as 10 million pounds at auction. That's how insanely valuable this base is. So I don't know if you're gonna wanna take that on the road, but let me know what you think with a comment down below. Until then, thank you all so much for watching, but I especially wanna thank my members over on Patreon, including Big Ben, who gave me the idea for this very video. I'm your Vinyl Geek, and I'll catch you on the flip side.